think we will have to try to find <coughs> alternative material in collections such as this. We may have to try and access the records of the SFA, the Scottish League, the Players' Union, bodies such as this. And I confess that I don't know the status of these records, or even whether they exist. But future historians will have to set about trying to find such material. Uh, I do not have the time uh, to pursue these leads, but I'm throwing them out to you because I think that you know they are potentially fruitful. But I think there's a lot the ordinary fan can do. I think that fans can play their part by obviously keeping memorabilia. Um, maybe the trust might uh, consider building a, a collection, an archive of such material, at least until such time as the club itself organises its records professionally. Or creates what many of us have been calling for for many years, namely a club museum. The Trust might consider its role in organising the pulling together of diverse source materials such as fanzines, match programmes, supporters, annuals and so on. And maybe such a collection could be digitised and made widely available. Supporters may not actually realise the value of a lot of things. The records of supporters' clubs, for example, may tell future historians a lot about the people who followed Rangers. Uh, their dedication, the trips they took, the charities they supported, the functions they held. One of the best sources of information, certainly when I was doing the biography, uh, certainly for the 50s and some of the 1960s, were the association, the Supporters Association annuals, which Besides a lot of informative detail about the actual matches and the team, uh, some great photographs, provided just the kind of information that I've mentioned about ordinary fans and the activities of the different branches of the Supporters Association. It would be great if the Trust could provide the practice of a substantial in information packed annual publication uh, such as this. I believe the last one was in 1967 or 68. Now, another idea that I throw out is to uh, create an archive of oral interviews of fans. Perhaps the more elderly fans, and I'm in that category now myself, um, who can shed light on various aspects of supporting the club in decades gone by and go into minute detail about this because, you know, as many of you will know, questions crop up on the, the Fall of Fall Board all the time about the stadium, for example. When, when was the roof put in the covered enclosure opposite the main stand? When did the roof go on the Copeland Road end? Um, uh, why were the complaints about the floodlights? Uh, when did they first use the floodlights? Uh, where did that cocktail bar in the main stand go to? Um, questions like this. Uh, it may be rather exotic to some people and, and uh, you know, very uh, quirky. But the fans, the real fans, want to know everything about the club. Um, as, as for the cocktail bar, just let me tell you that uh, it was quite a surprise to me that when reading the memoir of a Celtic supporter, Hugh Savage, it turned out that he had been one of the workers who put the cocktail bar in the stadium in the 1930s. And he said in his memoir that he formed a favourable impression, remember he's a diehard Celtic fan, favourable impression of everyone who worked at Ibrox, particularly Mr. Struth, who indeed provided them with complimentary tickets for a match, a practice which he discovered was not followed at Celtic Park. And Mr. Struth's attitude, of course, was also, it has to be said in some contrast to that of the Rangers directors in 1969, as I've pointed out in More's The Pity. But I think this story makes my point. 
There was an abundance of testimony, reminiscence, anecdote, as well as hard information about Rangers out there in a multitude of forms, in a variety of sources, some of them very unexpected. I think we just need to be imaginative and resourceful and set about finding this material. And I think the Trust can give a lead in this respect and develop the great work that it's done already. And if the fans show the way, I think the club will have to respond, just as it did over the fans' clamour for a proper tribute to the victims of the Irish disaster. Now, <coughs> mention of that tragedy leads me back to research which I have done in this myself uh, over the years, which I published in the form of a chapter in Ronnie Esplin's book, Ten Days That Shoot Rangers, a chapter in a book called Soccer and Disaster, edited by Martin Johns, as well as the chapter in the official biography. Now it's a grim irony that one of the most important collections of material on the club is the disaster archive which is held in the Mitchell Library here in Glasgow. The bulk of it of course is concerned with the events of that horrible day but there's also much in this archive in the way of information about the stadium, crowds throughout the years, the behaviour of fans, insights into attitudes at boardroom level <coughs> and so on. Much more can be done with this body of material. My work is only a start. And there's also the police <coughs> records around the Agnes disaster. And police and court records in general, I think, may bear fruit for researchers into football crowds and supporters' cultures over the years. Certainly, mention might be made here, it's another academic I'm afraid, uh, the work of Andrew Davies, who is a social historian at the University of Liverpool, and he has published articles about Rangers and Celtic fans in the interwar period in the 20s and 30s. The disturbances, the fights and so on, the planned battles, it all sounds quite reminiscent uh, of more recent decades. And he's done this chiefly through the records of court cases uh, and the reporting of court cases and so on of the period. And it's very richly textured work. <coughs> Now, I mentioned earlier that fans might contribute items to an archive. Um, such an archive, I think, should also gather uh, film material and rangers where possible. What I mean here is really documentary material, TV documentaries over the years. Um, uh, I remember one which I think Mark Supporters Club was involved in, with Rangers fans and Derry City fans, and that was back in. Uh, the late 1980s, I think. So, I mean, there's these documentaries out there which I think are fascinating records. And um, there's also uh, the film uh, The Big Clubs, uh, which was produced uh, or um, released in 1974. It was directed by a German. Um, it's not Willy Waddle's finest hour, um, but it's also a deeply flawed film. Uh, but it is. Uh, a valuable document of the period nonetheless. So there is the odd cinema cinematic treatment uh, as well. <coughs> Finally there's the press, both local and national. There's still a lot of nuggets to be found in that trawl through the press, through the papers. Although I think more attention maybe should be given to papers which had uh, a popular football focus, such as, for instance, the Weekly News for the 30s, 40s and 50s, uh, the Scottish Daily Express for the 50s and 60s, uh, the Govan Press for the early years, rather than the uh, so-called qualities, like the Glasgow Herald, which for many years uh, used to treat football with a snobbish disdain that uh, Stuart's uh, would argue so.